Now, um, back to adults. Yes. Last year, you and I had a discussion. You and I had a discussion, um, and part of that discussion was how we could roll the new code, which you and Carmen have worked extensively on the last um, 25, 27 mm -hmm. years. How that could be integrated with a, learn a language learning course for adults mm -hmm. and teenagers, of course, mm -hmm. um, and how we could create a way that people could relatively quickly assimilate a language. The so for the uh, people who are watching this, mm -hmm. we created a program. Mm -hmm. um, you've called it First Learning. First Learning. How is this distinct? How does it work? How do people acquire these language, this language in a way that's relatively quick? And how does it tie back into the code pattern? Yeah. And NLP in general. And NLP in general. So there's a big question. Yeah, huge. Maybe I'll proceed by examples and then try to make a more general statement. Um, if I were to select one feature of this first fluency program that uh, Carmen and I and you are going to present in Spain in the Mejia region uh, this coming August, September, um, it is the state of the learner. Now, as an adult, there are two disadvantages that most adults find themselves at. One is the thing we already talked about, the knowledge base. Unless they have somehow developed through intuitive trial and error, I suppose, the ability to suspend access to this is going to be a positive uh, a positive filtering with a negative result, that they will tend to hear the Spanish words with the targets that are more typical of English, and therefore they won't have the accent which you're, they're attempting to reproduce. They're so going to anglicize they're going to the Spanish anglicize. words. Sure. And uh, <laughs> the second thing, the second thing is... Which I hear quite frequently in that region in Spain. Oh, sure. But, you know, let's give a little round of applause for the brave people who attempt to do it to the best of their ability. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the most amazing challenges, to become fluent in another language. Particularly Spanish, the where there are, where there are many different... Huge uh, phonological cultural differences. Phonological variations. Phonological variations. Otherwise. Spanish speakers are very forgiving. They do not insist in, this, in the same way that the French do on these tight phonological targets. If you get somewhere in the area, they're going to supply a menu. They're going to attempt to work out what it is you want and supply you with the right thing. So there's a, a quite a nice cultural advantage for Spanish. And Spanish has one other characteristic, which is nice. I would not, if I were learning English as a speaker of some other language, nor if I were to learn French as an English speaker, I would not use visual aid because the mapping between the spelling of words, the orthography, and the actual value phonetically, that is the pronunciation, is so strange, so weird. Indeed. Uh, as opposed to Spanish, where with maybe the exception of the double L becoming a Y, there's, there's it, what you see is what you get. So you can actually take a, a text in Spanish once you've begun this project and you can actually read it carefully and you'll sound like you're actually, <laughs> you know what you're doing. Um, if I were to pick a single most important thing, as I said, it would be state. And this has two elements to it, the one I just mentioned about active interference by your home language or other languages that you've acquired. And secondly, if you correct a child, if they hear the correction at all, they may blow right by it. If you correct a child, uh, the child hears it, repeats it, or ignores it, whatever, depending on where the focus of their attention is. When you correct an adult, the typical thing is, I say something, you're a native speaker of the language, which is my target, and you're being helpful, and you re-pronounce something that I missed, or you add a word that I left out, or you supply something that I put in there that doesn't really, really fit. And now, whether this continues as a implicit language lesson, with pleasure on both sides because of uh, the amusing, amusing experience of, of helping someone through the first stages of the language, depends on my response. If you make the correction, I go, oh, sorry. I, you know, didn't mean to. Blah, 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 blah. All that happens is you get the message, leave me alone. Because you've placed me in a, quote, embarrassing situation. If on the other hand I go, say it again, I watch your lips, full attention, I pronounce it, watching you to make sure by feedback that I've got the difference, that I didn't achieve the first time. 
And then I will attempt, this is my own style, I'll attempt to use that, that word, that new word, in at least three sentences in the next minute, just to set it for consolidation purposes later. The important part is the relational aspect. If I am positive in my response, I'm, I, I look hungry, I act on it, I use the information immediately, um, the, you as a native speaker are encouraged, ah, oh, this is somebody who's really interested and really committed to doing this, and you will continue to offer me precisely the class of feedback I need. Which does occur in Spain from Which does occur in Spain, yeah, from my experience as well. Spanish is particularly nice because you get many different cultures speaking language. Sure, there's variations in Chevere and Colombia is, you know, great, superb. Uh, and you don't find it in Mexican Spanish, and you don't find it in Spanish Spanish. And, but n notice the advantage, you can move all through Latin America with the exception of Brazil, and you'll be able to communicate effectively, and the cultures are quite the quite same, different. quite the same, including, of course, the homeland, Spain itself. And in different regions in Spain. And well. different regions, uh, you know, I never miss pointing out that there are strong regional differences <laughs> in Spain, <laughs> Catalan. Indeed, is one of the strongest examples. Okay, so so let me go back to this. So the state issue, the state, of course, the ideal in an ideal language acquisition, the state of the learner is a know-nothing state, where they don't understand anything except in the target language. They have no internal dialogue except in the target language. And by the way, there are little markers neurologically in in terms of my experiences. When I walk, when I'm acquiring a language, and I walk around running an internal dialogue in the target language, which, by the way, in, in this idealized situation, that's the only thing you're allowed in terms of internal dialogue is the, is the target language, not your, not your own language. I mean, you can tricks tricks like dropping the tongue and the Buddhist tongue poke and stuff to avoid those things. But nevertheless, uh, as as I walk around, I, I hear myself running a phrase or a set of words over and over and over, and I may not even know anything about what they mean. I'll probably have some sense of the context in which I heard them and adapted them or have used them successfully, but I may have no idea how to segment it. There are, there are phrases, especially in Greek, that I use and it's correct in the context, it gets the re required response from native speakers, I have no idea even how to segment it. That is what the, the pieces of this thing are. And that's not important, but when you discover yourself running these tapes, a very positive indication you've activated the proper neurology. Yeah, and I actually think I've got an experience of that from our uh, experience last year mm -hmm. in Spain, where mm -hmm. as you know, I attempted and Absolutely. struggled yeah. a little with Spanish, mm -hmm. um, but it was, we were there for six weeks in total, and there was one worker in the hotel who I developed quite a strong rapport with. It was in my interest to have a strong rapport uh, with this worker. He supported us incredibly. Mm -hmm. And he came in this particular afternoon, and towards the end of the course, and spoke, he forgot, I, he forgot who I was in terms of my linguistic competencies, and spoke to me for three or four minutes, totally in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sitting there, and for the first time, I actually understood what he was talking about. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and after he said, lo siento. Uh, and then we both realized, actually, that he was speaking in Spanish to me. We had struggled previously, mm -hmm. but because of the level of rapport there, I had actually un understood, his, understood his language and was in that no-nothing state at that moment in time because I wasn't attempting to understand, I wasn't attempting to do anything. We were there, the rapport connection was there. Is that, is that an example of what you're talking it's about? It's an excellent example. And, and matter of fact, I think especially I'll define in a moment first fluency. Uh, but I think that getting to first fluency, these mirroring tactics, these ability to establish and sustain a deep rapport relationship unconscious to unconscious with native speakers is key. Because if, if I'm moving like they're moving, if my gestures are authentically for the culture, uh, fit theirs, if my voice qualities and the rhythms in my voice, all of which are non verbals if they are authentic, they copied and mirrored from the person I'm working with, this creates a certain illusion. So I can actually make a mistake and they won't even hear the damn mistake. They'll, they'll automatically change what they've heard from an error to something which is congruent with the illusion I'm creating by mirroring. So the ability to establish and sustain rapport 
and especially the ability to copy and uh, emit uh, gestures, voice qualities, and so forth, which are not English or American English, they, are, they belong to the target language, is essential. And that special state, so let's go to first fluency. You were treated to three or four minutes of what first fluency will buy you forever if you get it. And that is first fluency I define as the point where you have enough phrases, expressions in the language supported by this huge illusionary net of using mirroring for voice qualities, gestures, postures, and typical behavior of the, the people of the target language, uh, will create the illusion you understand enough that a perfectly fluent bilingual uh, Spanish English speaker will stay in Spanish instead of coming out into English to quote, help you. Because that help is exactly what you don't want. Indeed. The whole point of first fluency is to create the illusion of adequate language so that native speakers or fluent speakers of the language will stay in the language. Because by so doing, they're feeding this machine, this set of circuitry, the same circuitry you used if you get your knowledge base out of the way that you used to acquire your first language. And refer you back to the argument that Chomsky exploited. We're, we're wired for this. Yes. So if we can get out of our own way and activate the proper set of neurological circuits, namely the ones we use to acquire our first language, things start to happen. Now, this is actually mixed modeling. This is not, if it were straight NLP modeling, the whole thing would be done inductively. You would never achieve any conscious understanding. But there are tricks. And as a professional linguist, I know about these tricks. In English, I shall eat at this restaurant tomorrow. Uh, maybe you in a play somewhere. I haven't heard anybody in the States ever use the word shall as a future tense in that way. It's quite formal. I think it's more common here. In the yeah, that, well, that could be said here. It could be said here. In the States, no. I'm going to eat in this restaurant tomorrow. I'm going to. Going to. And as a matter of fact, not only in Spanish, but in a number of other languages which I've dabbled in, um, if I, I, I could say comeré en este restaurante mañana, which is the formal I shall eat, pa, pa, pa. Boy. But that's not what they say. Boy. Boy. Boy a comer en este restaurante mañana. So I'm going to eat in it. So it's exactly a gloss of the way American English works. You don't ever have to learn the future tense. I mean, learning verb tenses is a bear. Because there are a lot of them. A lot of them, and the conditions under which they're used. I'm actually quite deficient in Spanish in the sense that they're, the Spanish uses subjunctive a lot, a lot more than English does. And I will run right over the top of that. If I happen to recognize that the verb I'm using takes a subjunctive, I'll make a switch on the fly and go into subjunctive. But many times, I don't make the switch. Now, this is perfectly intelligible. It's a little ugly <laughs> from a native speaker's point of view. But as a communication device, it works. Sure. So there are tricks like that. Another trick. So, so one strategy to take advantage of this uh, I'm going to uh, phenomena, which occurs in multiple languages. Boya. Boya. Uh, or vamos a. Vamos a we. Okay. Or uh, el va. Uh, whatever. He. Or, so, so the whole thing, you know, all, all the. Typical five tenses of the verb for I, you, he, she, it, we, right. they. Uh, the second person plural is, you, you can get, get by without it, although ultimately you'll acquire it by induction. Anyway, um, so that's a trick. Another trick is you never learn vocabulary. In the classic academic approach, you're given vocabulary list, English, Spanish. As if this really is a translation. That's not a translation. It's a joke. That's like learning NLP just from a book. That's like learning, right. learning, NLP, learning NLP from an exercise. Inductively. Right. The other thing, of course, is I think one of the most startling and challenging and at the same time deeply satisfying experiences I've had with languages is to notice how the world shifts as I shift language. Now, is the world really shifting? Well, I mean, now we're off into epistemology. So let me just say the following. When I speak German, the world has a different feel. Uh, the things I notice are different. When I speak uh, Italian, uh, once again, there's a whole difference <laughs> in my state. 
as you expressed yourself. As I express myself, and the way in which Italian and German and English and any other language carve up the world is strictly speaking incommensurable. That is, you can't really map from one to the other. You can get close. So, if you learn by vocabulary, you're accepting a presupposition which is flatly false, namely that these are equivalents. They're not. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you learn inductively in context by mimicry, by creating the solution we've talked about, um, you actually end up getting a feel for how Spanish segments experience in the world, which makes it profoundly different experience than when you speak English or you speak German. So, the, as soon as, as I see a vocabulary list, I go, no, <laughs> this is not the way I want to approach it, because the consequences really do rob part of the advantage of achieving another. But also through direct feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because part of our first fluency course will be the participants having learned to go into the altered states, Absolutely. having been given some of the um, short circuit drills you've spoken about here, having learned to mirror and model, to actually go out into the environment in small groups with a Spanish a Spanish, Spanish mentor who will support them and supply what they're lacking. And then go and buy products, so and do, drinks. Do commerce. Mm -hmm. Be social. Right. Meet people in the plaza. Have an exchange. And be restricted to speaking only Spanish. Exactly. I can't tell you how many times I've stood on a street corner in some country, <laughs> busy street corner, and ask directions to whatever is relevant to the mosque, if I happen to be in Islamic countries, you know, cathedral of them in the traditional sort of continental European situation. Not because I give a damn where the mosque or the cathedral is, but because it gives me a well-formed sentence to provoke an avalanche of language, assuming I do the rapport, assuming I use mirroring and so forth. A, an avalanche of language which feeds this astonishing set of circuits by which I learned to speak American English as a baby. So I'm just replicating that. So in that sense, I try to achieve the same accelerated and deep inductive learning as a child by becoming one, by getting rid of my knowledge base temporarily. I'm going to reactivate it later. But at the moment, it's nothing more than a, a filter which gets in my way.